Hello and welcome to the radiotimes.com Doctor Who podcast. Once again, broadcasting to you across the Subwave network. Uh, my name's Hugh Fullerton. My name's Morgan Jeffrey. Uh, and this week, we're delving into the weird and wonderful world of Doctor Who spin-offs. Yes, it's only been a few episodes, but already we're done with Doctor Who. <laughs> Moving on from that, and we're talking about lots of other shows. Now, this is a one-off special. We're looking at all the shows that have spun off from Doctor Who, uh, from Canine and Company through Torchwood, Sarah Jane Ventures and Class, to a few that never really got off the ground. Um, and yeah, just sort of thinking about why it is that Doctor Who has managed to continue, whereas most of the spin-offs haven't managed to last quite as long. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what what is it about um, Doctor Who that you think lends itself so well to having so many spin-offs? Partly just because of how long it is, I guess. Well, yeah, and also I think you know, every, it, Doctor Who's unique in that every single story takes the somewhere new, um, or for the most part introduces us to a whole new roster of characters, right? So there's so many opportunities there for potential spin-offs. Yeah, really, every Doctor Who story could be a pilot for a spin-off show, right? Definitely. I mean, if you think about, like, every series, they're saying, oh, that character should get their own spin-off, or oh, we'd love to see more of that story. Like you say, I mean, like, almost every Doctor Who story is like a movie in its own right. Like, you kind mm. of... You're, you're throwing out a sci-fi concept that would be the basis for a whole other TV series or film series. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, Stephen Moffat used to say that, didn't he? You know, Stephen Moffat used to say, um, you know, you've got a really good idea for a Doctor Who story when you think, oh, well, there goes that movie idea. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah or, 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 or idea for a spin-off TV pilot. Um, and so for as many Doctor Who spin-offs as there were or that were planned, there's, you know, so many other characters um, and stories that could potentially have uh, held their own spin-off, I think. Uh, so we should talk about the ones that actually did, or at least tried to, um, starting with, um, I think, the first one, correct me if I'm wrong, the first one that actually has managed to come to TV, or correct, was K9 and Company. Uh, K9 and Company in 1981, uh, with its pilot episode, A Girl's Best Friend. Yes, which is mainly remembered now for the slightly bizarre opening credit sequence where K9 just goes, do, 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 K9, do, K9. Yeah, over and over again, while Sarah Definitely. James jogs I, and I, swine. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the slightly surreal opening title sequence and theme tune to Canine and Company is probably the best thing about it. Yeah I mean it's it's not one that really took off uh it had one episode and it kind of we'll get onto this later but it kind of was the first of many sort of slightly odd canine related spin-offs of mm. all Doctor Who characters canine has been the subject of the most tv series I think. <laughs> <laughs> which is slightly bizarre when it's a little robot dog um but that's life i guess but yeah canine and company is a funny one because it's sort of one of those odd footnotes in history where a lot of people know about it but i don't think that many people have actually watched the pilot episode or it's a it's available now on Britbox. should so, you should you be in an odd mood yeah. we're um, on time at the moment but do, do we have <laughs> <much> time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe now, maybe now is the time to have a couple of glasses of wine, uh, kick back and watch K9 and Company. Go no, it was go for a jog with your sweater knotted around your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the idea behind it initially was that uh, K9 was a popular character, particularly with you know Doctor Who's younger viewers, uh, but was uh, you know, qu causing quite a bit of hassle on the set of uh, Doctor Who in the sense that uh, technically he w he was quite difficult to operate, but also um, he kind of took over the stories to a certain degree. You know, K9 had so many different capabilities and abilities that uh, he, he kind of became an all-purpose uh, plot solver. Mm. So the idea was to launch him into his own spin-off series where he could be the lead. Um, and then on top of that, you had Elizabeth Sladen, who had previously turned down the opportunity to return to Doctor Who as a companion to bridge the gap between Tom Baker and Peter Davison. But then she was interested in returning as, again, sort of, the, the lead in her own show, or at least co-lead uh, next to the Tin Dog. Yeah, and in the end, you kind of end up with this sort of kind of odd TV proposition. But then it does have this odd legacy in that Elizabeth Sladen and K9 do end up in a TV series together in the end. Longer. Right. And, and yeah, and it's, it's, as you say, it is a strange little uh, oddity, a little nugget in, in Doctor Who history, oft forgotten. But then it actually, actually its impact is quite significant when you think about how not only did Sarah Jane and K9 um, return as a pair to modern Doctor Who, um, but then went on to, to have their own very successful spin-off series uh, many years later. Which we'll get to shortly. Uh, mm. But first, we should, if we're going through chronologically, we should jump on to the first actually running spin-off, I suppose you could say, you know, beyond the yeah. 
uh, which is obviously uh, Torchwood. Um, so Torchwood, when you actually look back, it's astonishing how quickly Torchwood came along because it's the year after Doctor Who comes back, right? 2006, mm. like the first episode of Torchwood is. And the seeds were already being planted by the end of the first series of Doctor Who, right? Because I, I mean, I know most Doctor Who fans know this, you know, the, the story that Torchwood is an anagram of Doctor Who and that was the anagram that was being used um, as a code name yeah. for when the first series of the revived show was being shot. But also I'm pretty sure the Torchwood Institute gets a shout out in Bad Wolf, which is uh, the penultimate episode of series one. It's a weakest link answer, I think. Mm, yeah. Um, um, so the seeds were there for a long while. And actually, to be honest, even before that, I, th I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the story goes that Russell T. Davis was developing a pilot for the BBC called Excalibur, which was mm. kind of a team fighting, I think, aliens or some, you know, kind of a sci-fi fantasy show, which would be a, a team fighting things. And that ended up, he ended up doing Doctor Who first, and then Excalibur morphed into Torchwood. Um, so it's kind of interesting that Torchwood is almost older than revived Doctor Who. It's not. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, it came, it came first, technically. And I imagine the way it played out was the BBC just saw, you know, the potential of Doctor Who or the extent to which it was taking off and just went to Rossity Davies, got anything else? And he had this Excalibur script in his back pocket. Well, also, I think I remember hearing somewhere that apparently there was a time when they thought, Torchwood is going to be the thing that keeps going. They thought, oh yeah, we'll get a few series, you know, a couple of years out of revived Doctor Who, but Torchwood, that'll just run and run and run, you know, new cast mm. of the Holby City, just every year, just more Torchwood coming out because it's easier to make, I suppose. And yeah. you know, it, it was it was more sta standard sets and like location work. It wasn't completely different every single week. Obviously, it didn't work out that way, but we do actually have, considering Torchwood, you know, people think you know cut down too soon. There's quite a lot of Torchwood, even in those first mm. two series, because there's 13 episodes, each of which is slightly longer than Doctor Who episodes. They're 50 minutes. Same length as Doctor Who now, but, you know, when, when at the time it was 45. And each episode for the first two series is more or less a standalone story. There's a lot. There's a lot there. Mm. And I think, as well, we kind of forget now. We just take it as granted that Torchwood was this post-Watershed adult spin-off from Doctor Who. Uh, that was quite a risky idea at the time, quite daring, you know, the, Really, you know, the, the, the business smart thing to do would be to produce another series kind of more in the vein of Doctor Who, um, aiming for you know, roughly the same audience. Um, so to do something that was for, as I said, post-Warshed slot um, with uh, greater levels of violence, bad language, um, was actually taking a bit of a leap into the dark. Definitely. Um, and it's interesting as well that, like, I think... Obviously, when we're, we're going to get to Sarah Jane Adventures, we don't want to keep talking about it. But with Sarah Jane Adventures, it kind of feels like an obvious spin-off, and she's a really popular character been around for ages. And you know, K Nine is this sort of iconic figure in the series. With Torchwood, they had Captain Jack Harkness. I think it's a mark of like how much John Barrowman did with very little time. In that he's only in about less than half of you know the first Doctor Who series. He's in like mm, what is it five episodes mm. um, total, and then off the back of that, he's suddenly yeah he's suddenly the lead in this TV show, like, and he's the sort of main character. And at the time it felt completely natural. It was like, oh yeah, Jack, you know, Captain Jack, he's really cool. I like Captain Jack. Let's have him in his own series. But actually like, it was, must've been a bit of a punt as well because, you know, they must've barely known that whether Jack would be popular or not before they were already starting development on, you know, giving him his own team and, you know, setting him yeah. up in, in the hub. I guess, I guess they saw the dailies coming in and they knew, they knew Barrowman was a charisma machine. They knew he could carry <laughs> his own, his own series. Um, but it's interesting, I do remember when it was announced and there was um, a, a promo shot of, of John Barrowman and, and Eve Miles, who of course had just appeared in Doctor Who shortly before that as Gwyneth uh, mm. in The Unquiet Dead. And it, 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 it was just halcyon days to be a Doctor Who fan, the idea that the show was back and we were already getting a spin-off. Um, and then Sarah Jane followed shortly afterwards and we had three Doctor Who related series on at the same time. Um, Within a week actually, um, that, that year, Christmas 2006, it was the Runaway Bride on Christmas Day. There was a double bill of Torchwood on New Year's Day, as well as the first ever Sarah Jane Adventures on the same day on New Year's mm. Day. Like, we, it's crazy. We went, we went from being starved of Doctor Who content as fans to suddenly having, you know, being overstuffed <laughs> with a glut of it, but a, a glorious glut of it. Um, speaking of Torchwood, obviously, uh, we've been doing uh, some watch-along things uh, with various TV shows where, um, you know, while everyone's at home uh, during the lockdown or in self-isolation or whatever is going on where you are we've been getting people to re-watch uh you know favorite episodes of tv and we started off uh with called midwife and we've done torchwood as well 
so I've been revisiting uh, Torchwood a bit, which has been interesting. And it, you know, I mean, it it strikes me what a great setup it is. Like as much as you know, I think everyone has a sort of wry smile at some Torchwood episodes and a few Torchwood lines. Like even even the cast, I think, uh, talked about. Um, we're talking about when we did our Q and A. They were sort of laughing about Cyber Woman a little bit, um, mm. and you know about the sex gas. Everyone loves the sex gas, but there's a lot of fun in it as well. And to be honest, watching it back, I was just struck by what a what a solid concept it is. Like it just kind of the way that like the the team and the setup and stuff. I'm just like, yeah, I totally get this. I totally believe this world exists like within Doctor Who. The one thing I always find very odd is that after Torchwood ends in well, it doesn't end in Children of Earth, but after that sort of setup ends at the end of Children of Earth, and they go, Oh, Torchwood is over. I'm like, isn't the rift still like dropping <laughs> people's everywhere? They're like, ah, oh, it's fine. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff like that. Like, aren't there still cracks and I don't know, what happened to the rift and yeah. yeah. Um and the TARDIS no longer needs to refuel um by visiting the rift apparently either. Um <laughs> I think it's pretty common consensus that, you know, Torchwood took a little while to find its feet, even though from the beginning there were flashes of real brilliance. Um, but as it, because famously it jumped from channel to channel, started out on BBC Three, then went to BBC Two, then BBC One. And each time it did, it really upped its game. Um, and you really saw a sizable leap in quality each time it made that jump. And by the time you get to Series Three, obviously Children of Earth, I remember, it's easy, I keep on saying it's easy to forget, but it was such a sensation at the time. Like, I remember mm. I was listening to the news quiz on Radio 4 and they just talked about, our oh, torture was great, like this week. <laughs> like, it's bizarre, like it's just not, or maybe it was the Now Show, but it was just like not the sort of thing that would normally be on it. And I think it was, yeah. I think it kind of came at a good time when, you know, I mean, we're talking through different times at the moment where a lot of people are inside watching TV, but the general trend over the last few years has been less in terms of drama being a rent television. There are still exceptions like Bodyguard and Line of Duty and stuff, but Torture of Children of Earth, spread over f five episodes over five nights felt like at the time loads of people were watching that and were really into yeah. it and it kind of felt like torchwood finally hit its mark in terms of what torchwood is which is slightly bleaker doctor who it's not necessarily like more sexy doctor who and it's not necessarily more like sweary doctor who it's kind of just like doctor who but where you don't have a superhero to come and right. take I, yeah i can't remember it might have even been rusty davis who described it as what a do what Doctor Who story would be like if the Doctor didn't show up. Which he um, then also wrote. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, you know, someone might well save the day, but probably a quite a few more people would die first. Um, really? and, and that's very much what Children of Earth was. And I think part of the strength of Tortured was that it did reinvent itself um, in terms of its style and its format with every series. Um, but having said that, I do kind of wish we'd gotten another series in the vein of Children of Earth. Um, yep. maybe another five day event, you know, which worked so well for Children of Earth would have felt like a gimmick if they'd done it again. Um, but having said that, I would have loved it, you know, I would have loved it to, to have seen them do um, another mini series with that kind of huge scope and this idea of a global disaster. Definitely. I mean, there was, there were also things like, there were little through lines from the first two series that were never quite picked up. And obviously Miracle Day, like, has its detractors and people who really like it. But I feel like you lose something from, and I'm not biased just because I grew up there, but from not being in Cardiff, torture is just not the same, you know? Yeah. Like, it was just, it, it lost a little bit of that color. It kind of felt like just another kind of glossy TV show. And I know they did go back to Wales a couple of times in that series, but generally speaking, it just made it feel a little bit more generic, a little bit I think, interesting. Yeah, I think, I think Miracle Day suffered as well from trying to be too many things to too many people and that it was trying to function as a relaunch um, of the show or, or a new pilot for American viewers and also a continuation of the show that fans had already enjoyed. And also I think uh, it was an attempt to top Children of Earth um, and that the, the premise of, of Miracle Day that just death stops. Um, I think the, the consequences of that and the ramifications of that are so huge and so far reaching that it's incredibly difficult to do that idea justice. Um, and, and I think I think Miracle Day struggled with that a little bit. I mean, here's the burning question. Do you think Torchwood's going to come back? I, who knows if it will or not, uh, but I think I see no reason why it couldn't. I don't feel like it's in any way, it's the kind of show because it constantly reinvented itself. It's, it's in no way, the format or the idea of Torchwood is in no way dated. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not a show that you go, oh, you couldn't possibly do that today or make that work today. Um, the, the, you know, the basic premise of Torchwood, uh, with a few basic tweaks, uh, would absolutely work in 2020, I think. Definitely. 
And I feel like as well, if anyone's listening to us thinking, ah, it never happened. We never thought we'd get John Barrowman back as Captain Jack at all. And then all of a sudden he's, you know, in episode five of the most recent series. And, you know, there's rumours that that's not the last we'll see of him, whether that means there'll be another cameo or a guest spot or, you know, whether he'll even come back full of time, who knows. Um, so kind of everything's up to play for. I think the thing with Torchwood is it's like Doctor Who's always going to be the focus. And I think, especially at the moment, it might be one of those things where doing a new Torchwood feels like, uh, not even extravagance exactly but it feels like more difficult as a thing to kind of pitch to somebody is like let's revive this series that hasn't been on for a long while also people who are currently executives might prefer to have their own ideas and to bring in new things if they were going to do Doctor Who spin-offs um as then, we'll find later that doesn't always work <laughs> no and then, and you know who knows it is an established property that um that has a, a definite fan following so that could that could be attractive um I think the thing is as well Torchwood was so much part and parcel of the Russell T Davies era of Doctor Who. Mm. Um, and so to bring it in now might feel slightly odd alongside a very different version of Doctor Who. Having said that, Chris Chibnall, who's now the showrunner of Doctor Who, was previously showrunner on Torchwood. He has close connections to the show. Um, so who knows? Yeah, that's all we can keep saying over and over again is who knows. Because <laughs> who knows? One, one we just have the part. We would have been, exactly, we would have been extremely definite, oh, that can never happen. But the last few years of Doctor Who have shown us that genuinely anything could happen. Right, the, the Captain Jack character, you know, what I just said about Torchwood feeling like um, it's very much part of the Ross T Davies era, you could have said the same of uh, just Captain Jack. And the fact that he's now appeared in uh, Doctor Who just in that past series proves that there's no reason why Torchwood couldn't also make a comeback. Uh, so we should move on to uh, Torchwood's regular stable mate uh, mm. of the mid noughties which was obviously the Sarah Jane Adventures, uh, which is a funny title, but good show, um, which, you know, <laughs> you, you sort of said earlier about how there must be a temptation to just create another spin-off that is in the sort of uh, mien of Doctor Who. And I mm. feel like although it is a more at kids, Sarah Jane Adventures, some Sarah Jane Adventures stories could be Doctor Who episodes, if you get Yeah. It. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely, um, to, to a certain extent, they had all age ranges uh, covered off when you had those three shows on at the same time, right? Because you had the kind of mainstream family audiences, Doctor Who, it can appeal to slightly younger viewers, but also slightly older viewers. You've got Torchwood, which is aimed at the older audience, and then you've got uh, Sarah Jane, which can be enjoyed by uh, slightly younger uh, uh, fans. Um, but no, I think you're right. In the, I think Sarah Jane, again, like with Torchwood, maybe took a little while to find its feet, but um, some of the stuff it produced later on was, was really strong. Um, really emotional. I think very emotional. Um, I, it definitely holds up. Some of the later stuff definitely holds up with some of the best stuff that Doctor Who was putting out at the time. Um, things like uh, Curse of Clyde Langer by Phil Ford. That's a great story. Um, the Wedding of Sarah Jane Smith, which um, was so good they repeated it, I remember, on BBC One on Christmas Day, uh, the morning of Christmas Day, 2009, I think, which was the same day that End of Time Part One well, it's cause David uh, went out. It was like a prequel, wasn't it? Like it kind of, it set slightly before. Oh, I think it is the last thing David Tennant filmed as the 10th Doctor. I think you're right. Yeah, um, but yeah, it set slightly before uh, the events of the End of Time. Um, so I guess that's a little prequel. But yeah, that was great getting David Tennant. And obviously then they got, they got um, Matt Smith later on as well, uh, for Death mm -hmm. of the Doctor. That was a great episode. I enjoyed that. Um, and what, whatever happened to Sarah Jane, that was a good one, wasn't it? Yeah, like it, it sort of, um, as, as, you know, as much as I want, don't want to do down kids TV, um, Sarah Jane Adventures was slightly punching above its weight in many ways. Um, it, you know, it was, it was far more polished and far more emotional and far more, uh, had far more depth than it necessarily needed to, uh, just to please a slightly younger CBBC audience. I think they were kind of lucky in a way as well in that it, they felt, it felt freer for Doctor Who stuff to appear in the Sarah Jane Adventures. Like, just to compare another sort of thing where um, spin offs. So, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right, had the spin off mm. Angel. And in Angel, Buffy turns up a couple of episodes, you know, a couple of other characters turn up, you know, people move between them, Angel comes back. Like, that sort of thing very, always feels very possible. Because Torture was a bit more adult, it did sometimes feel a bit strange if Doctor Who stuff would move into it. Not that it never did. Like, obviously, Martha Jones is in it, and the Torchwood cast do come into um, uh, The Stolen Earth and uh, Journey's End. Can't remember the titles then. But it was less of a two-way street. Where Sarah Jane Adventures, you've obviously got David Tennant's in it for a, for an episode or two. Um, Matt Smith's in it. You actually have the Doctor in it. You have Jadoon in it. You have Slavine in it. 
you have you know you have all sorts really there's you know the brigadier the brigadier's in it and nicholas courtney's final ever appearance yeah. as the brigadier is in the sarah jane adventures which was wonderful and i know many fans were hoping he would make one last appearance in doctor who uh once the revived series was underway sadly never happened who knows maybe that was the sarah jane appearance was um you know setting the stage for a grand doctor who return which sadly never happened uh but i think it's fantastic that we got the brigadier back in there but you're but you're right as well in that i think Ross C. davies even said actually that the doctor would never appear in torchwood um yeah. for the reasons i mentioned earlier that if the doctor showed up he could probably solve <laughs> um most of the problems that torchwood faced with a quick um wave of the sonic screwdriver but also because the doctor didn't belong in that world um no. whereas he could quite when, easely sorry, sorry. It, felt, it felt weird when um Martha turned up and like Owen was making like sex jokes. I'm like, oh, that's not allowed. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, whereas the Doctor can quite easily step into the world of Sarah Jane Adventures. Definitely, yeah. Um, and I also think uh, Clyde and Rani were two of the best Doctor Who companions we never got. That's true. Although we did get Anjali Mahindra in the main series very recently, of course. Uh, playing a very different role. Yes, playing uh, Queen Skiffer. And also we got one of Sarah Jane Adventures villains uh, as a companion bradley walsh made his doctor who debut in sarah yeah Jane, not in fact was not actually played. as not actually as odd bob the clown though but no, um, no, um sadly not um, that was actually an episode that i was supposed to be in uh they filmed it at my school uh while i was doing my um my final exams and i was sick i had to go to hospital so i missed out on being in sarah Jane adventures twice actually no, actually no i think the clown one was the second one the first one was one of the first episode clyde was in or something and then the second time we were told our exams were too important so we couldn't be abducted by Bradley Walsh. Um, so nothing the year below nothing is more important than a cameo in the Sarah Jane adventures. Come I on. know, what were they thinking? What a miss out. I mean, and it's my place in the Hooniverse would have been assured, sadly. You sadly. would have had your own entry in the TARDIS wiki. Oh, you were denied. that would be great. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's the dream, right, for everybody. Um, but yeah, so that was Sarah Jane adventures. Obviously, as, as well, like, there's a sort of note of sadness with Sarah Jane adventures in that it was mm. cut cruelly short. Um, Elizabeth Sladen very sadly passed away um, kind of during filming. Um, so or they, I think they, they were in the middle of filming um, the later series. So it's kind of it kind of a bit of sweet air to the last few episodes, I think, in that it wasn't supposed to be the end and mm. it kind of just sort of stops, you know, rather than building to a grand conclusion. Yeah, yeah, it never has that grand finale. But also I guess there's something nice in that in the sense that you can kind of keep the idea that maybe they're still there. Um, you know, Sarah Jane and the team are still there fighting threats uh, from different planets and different times. Yeah, that's a nice idea. I mean, I, I like the little thing in um, Turn Left. I know that was when they were still making the shows, but where like the Doctor goes and the, basically the Sarah Jane crew and the Torture crew do save the world, but just all die. Like, they like, just <laughs> do a very good job at it. And I kind of like the idea that they would still be out there trying to fix stuff. Um, yeah. So we should talk as well. But both those, I think you can say, were quite big successes as spin-offs. Mm. Like, and neither of them are on TV anymore, obviously, but they ran for a fair good while, you know, had a fair bit of critical acclaim, lots of fans and stuff, you know, people still talk about them. Um, and then more recently, uh, we, we had the news that there was going to be another Doctor Who spin-off. I mentioned Buffy earlier. Buffy was name-checked as a kind of influence on this. It was called Class. Um, so, yeah, Class was set in Coal Hill School, now Coal Hill Academy, which is the school that's appeared in Doctor Who quite a lot. It was in the first ever episode and had a cameo from Peter Capaldi in the first episode um, uh, of class. And yeah, basically it was about a bunch of kids, including one or two who were aliens and a teacher who was an alien, who try and stop stuff coming through. Essentially the rift again, but not with the rift, it's something else. It's the rift slash the cracks in time. It was called like the, the tear, I think, mm. or something like that. So class is a funny one because it, it felt like it was a really big deal, Doctor Who was getting a spin-off. You know, Torchwood hadn't been on for quite a few years at this stage. You know, this was in the midst of um, there was going to be a big break for Doctor Who, so they were do bring in this new spin-off. Patrick Ness, who was this really um, you know, really great YA author, um, who hadn't really written for TV before, was coming in to write it, and that sounded really interesting. He'd written this great book about superheroes and stuff. That, well, not superheroes, but kind of like sci-fi tropes in a high school which the rest of us just live here which i thought would make a great thing but class never i felt like it never really got a good chance do you know what i mean like i feel like it kind of it was slightly hamstrung by when torture started it was on bbc3 which was on mm. tv whereas by the time class came along bbc3 had moved online so i don't think it ever quite broke out of that broke out of that bubble 
No, I, I don't know, you know, rightly or wrongly, I don't know how much confidence the BBC actually had in class. I think it fell slightly awkwardly in the sense that it was a time of great transition for Doctor Who. You know, it fell in between the Stephen, kind of in between the Stephen Moffat and, uh, or to, towards the end of the Stephen Moffat era, just before the Chris Chibnall era. Um, it wasn't, as I say, part and parcel of an era in the same way that Torchwood or Sarah Jane were of the Russell T Davies era. Um, and I think as well, you know, it, it, it lacked direction in the sense that, it, it, it wasn't a spin-off that anyone was crying out for, right? So um, even though Torchwood came together quite quickly, the idea of a spin-off for Captain Jack was something that got fans excited. Similarly, as, as soon as Sarah Jane rocks up in school reunion and K-9's back at her side, you go, well, that's, you know, that's perfect setup for a spin-off. Cole Hill? Was anyone crying out for a Cole Hill spin-off? Um, it, it, it felt like Patrick Ness maybe had a really good pitch for a, a YA Buffy-esque series, and then the Doctor Who link was purely cosmetic. Well, I feel like the thing, the, the point you're, you're circling there is definitely that, like, spin-offs work with characters, right? They don't work with locations. Like, yeah. if, it's like, here's a new series set in the same school. It's the reason I think that, you know, the Skins, right, UK series Skins, rebooted with the cast every couple of years. I think the reason that was a kind of diminishing return is that people like the cast, like people yeah. don't necessarily like the format or the location. Mm -hmm. People kind of in, enjoyed those characters. So as there were few and few of them around, it's kind of like, why am I even watching this? Is it the same show? And I think with class, it was like, with Torchwood, it's a show based around, a, we're pulled in through the character that we know in this new situation. It's interesting to see this new situation. Same with Sarah Jane Adventures. We're pulled in with this character who we've already know. With mm -hmm. class, it's like, who do we know in this? We don't know anybody. The school's not even uh, the same school that's been rebuilt. Mr. Armitage. <laughs> there, was, there was a Cole Hill teacher from Doctor Who, Mr. Armitage, who made it till the second episode until he was brutally torn apart. But, exactly. Uh, yeah. like, like if Clara had still been around. Like if Clara had... Like, Even looked, Danny like, Pink. If Danny Pink had stuck around, he would have been the star. Um, no, no shade to Samuel Anderson. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, genuinely, if they had like a companion leave to start this new thing, I think it would have made sense. As it was, it just felt a bit, like you say, it kind of felt like just a show they were making, which had a bit of a Doctor Who skin. Peter Capaldi yeah. turns up at the end of the first episode and says, listen, you you five 16-year-olds, you seem to have handled this horrible, murderous alien pre Well, one of you got your leg chopped off, another one's girlfriend died. You're all right with the rest. I'm just going to just gonna pop off. Um, yeah. I'm going to go and check out, you know, some smiling robots with Bill. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, this is it. I think... I think um, a little bit like early Torchwood, um, the tone of class as well was quite uneven. It would veer from this gruesome bloodshed to these fun alien antics. Um, but whereas Torchwood was given room to grow and grew spectacularly, I don't think class, class ever was. Um, I think if it had been given a second series, it could potentially have uh, mended some of what was wrong and it could have grown into something quite interesting. But instead it ended on a cliffhanger and never had that chance. Yeah, I think it's a shame because, you know, and it's a great cliffhanger with the Weeping Angels turning up because the mm. whole thing, again, we had a little precursor to Jodie Whittaker's first series where we were told over and over again, we're not going to have Doctor Who monsters in class. And actually, mm. obviously, they were just secretly saving the Weeping Angels to be the big bad, which was a really cool idea. And that was one of the things that works well in terms of, you know, we talked about Sarah Jane having elements of Doctor Who included really well. That was a great, you know, element that was included quite well, I think. But I think by that stage, it was almost felt a bit late. Like, people kind of it felt like there wasn't a lot of promotion behind it. Like I'm sure there was, but it didn't mm. really get the message out in the same way. And it was moved around a bit. Like it didn't go on TV until absolutely ages after it already debuted online. And yeah, it was, as you say, it was on iPlayer and then repeated on BBC one, like it felt like a long time later and in a quite a late night slot as well. Um, so then understandably underperformed uh, you know, in the ratings. I think given what we talked about though, about how it might've been a good idea to have an established Doctor Who character, um, kind of hit you know be the lead in that show i actually think the cast were great in that show oh, yeah, um no, it's, it's actually a really great cast and like Catherine kelly's brilliant as miss quill like that's, mm. a, that's such a great character and such a cool doctor who character i think it's a shame she never got to be in the main series because she's yeah an interesting creation and maybe given time those characters could have grown to become uh you know beloved parts of the of the of the hooniverse uh but with the cancellation that never happened well, I mean, to some people, they are still beloved, I think. There's still a lot of um, class fans out there. And oh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, Big Finish have made a lot of um, class stories with uh, some of the cast returning and uh, some new people subbing in here and there. They, I think Sophie Aldred did a, did a, did a story as Ace, going back to Cole Present Hill. Present day Ace, yeah. yeah um, I think Big Finish's contract means they can't 
produce any stories set after the first series, though. So all their class uh, productions are set during the run of the original series, which means they can't, they still can't resolve the cliffhanger with the Weeping Angels. Oh, no, I I had no idea. That's really funny. (laughs) It's it's a cursed, endless cliffhanger that the Weeping Angels are always poised, ready to strike, and we'll just never (laughs) know what they actually got up to. But I think class illustrates something good is that, like, it's not easy to create a spin-offs for any show. And I think Doctor Who is such a weird, unique show. The unique selling point of Doctor Who is that it's constantly changing and different. And it's kind of its own spin-off every so often. Like every three or four years, there's a new lead actor, you know, a new writer, a new setting almost. If you the TARDIS and the places they go, a whole new cast. Like Doctor Who is constantly spinning off from itself. So I think you need a lot of kind of character and like great performances from the actors to actually make a spin-off work at all like i mean there's so many that haven't even left the blocks right there's so many that have almost mm. been made and haven't like you you were telling me earlier one about one about daleks yeah so terry nation who was the creator of the daleks he uh in the mid 1960s at the height of what was known as dalek mania uh he tried to launch uh, a dalek tv spin-off uh in the u.s tried to sell it to, to u.s buyers uh unsuccessfully in the end although again big finish another shout out they uh they actually finally recorded his uh, script for the pilot episode or an adaptation of that uh, for audio and released it in 2010. So you can actually hear that. Um, but yeah, Daleks could have got their own spin-off. Yeah. And, you know, we all, I think a lot of us will remember that I think Billy Piper was offered a spin-off or there, were, there was an idea of her to have a spin-off set in the parallel world called what, Rose, Rose Tyler Earth Defense. Earth Defense. Rose Tyler Earth Defense. Yeah. It was this idea that there would... Um, after Rose left the first time in Doomsday, that there would be this 90 minute special, um, I think on like a, a, a sort of fittingly enough around Easter time, uh, mm. there would be this one off special that then could potentially become a, an annual event. Um, and it would have been set in the alternate world where Rose was left at the end of Doomsday. Uh, and it was commissioned by BBC One. Um, I think Billy Piper hadn't been formally approached, but had been, you know, there'd been discussions about her starring in it. And then it was actually Russell T. Davies' decision to can it at quite a late stage because he felt like it would uh, take away from some of the power of Rose's original exit. Yeah, um, which wasn't definitely wasn't taken away when she came back like a year later anyway. No! <laughs> um, I see his point, but also I think it speaks to the power that Russell Davies had at that time, that something that was already commissioned by the BBC, he could turn around and go, no, nah, I, don't, I don't fancy it. And they, they just canned the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but but appa- apparently that spin-off... Yeah, <laughs> and apparently that spin-off would have featured... Um, uh, alternate versions, you know, from the parallel world. New versions of Adam Mitchell, uh, Bruno Langley's character, Captain Jack, uh, alternate Gwen. Um, so it could have been really interesting, I think. I mean, again, we're going to sort of just say Big Finish have, uh, I think, explored this idea a little bit as well. I think they got Billy Piper to do some um, alternate world stuff. Uh, I think we call the Doomsday Canon or something. The Dooms- yeah, Dimension yeah. Canon. The Dimension Canon, yes, I was thinking of Doomsday. Uh, so again, a Big Finish are sort of picking up the, the slack of spin-offs that almost were, and you can well, and again, what it would have been. Yeah, and again, another um, Doctor Who spin-off that was mooted way back in the 70s, of course, was Jago and Lightfoot, who were two uh, very popular charismatic supporting characters from the talons of Wang Chiang. Um, and there, there was talk about them getting their own show, which didn't ultimately happen. But again, I think Big Finish have done something. <laughs> they did something like 14 series of that. Um, so if you want to track those adventures down, they are out there. Definitely. Um, when there were also plans around the same time as for like the Young Doctor Chronicles or something. Uh, around, around the time of um, Sarah Jane adventures, yeah. Well, it was actually the, the precursor to Sarah Jane. Uh, the, uh, CBBC saw the success that Doctor Who was having on Saturday nights for BBC One and said, we want a bit of that action. Um, and so I approached Russell T Davies with this idea of Young Doctor Who, the Doctor at the Academy. Um, but In he, the sonic screwdriver and all that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How, how the sonic screwdriver was made. Uh, you know, getting into scrapes with the master. Um, and... Uh, Russell T Davies just shot them down and said no, no um, but I'll do the Sarah Jane adventures if you like um, and thank goodness he did because A I don't think that sounds like a very good idea and B we got the Sarah Jane adventures out of it. Um, so, so how would it fit in with the timeless children you know like I just, I just... you know I did I did think that it's essentially the timeless child isn't it? It's, it's, <laughs> um, I, it's, going back to what you were saying earlier though you know I think Doctor Who does have that unique premise um, in terms of every story being different uh, but also, it's you know, it's not the only time travel show. Um, what I think the Do- Doctor Who really has, though, that sets it apart from other sci-fi and fantasy shows, is it has the Doctor, right? Mm. Which which is what makes um, spin-offs from Doctor Who 
so hard to pull off because if you take the doctor out of doctor who what do you have um so unless you have a really good concept like torchwood or a supporting character who's already you know beloved by fans like sarah jane it is really hard to pull off something like this i think well i mean they've been trying to do canine spin-offs for years and years i mean there's yeah. constantly news about there's going to be a new canine film or new canine they've done a couple i think of like a canine animated series and there was one there, in australia i think yeah there was a it was a bbc australian co-production no involvement from the bbc um more of a sort of passion project by bob baker who was canine's co-creator um and that was again it was aimed at a younger audience uh, i think it aired on disney xd in the uk and it was quite a similar format to sarah jane that was uh a, a new version of canine teaming up with a spirited team of young humans to form the front line of defense against alien menaces and so on um but it does have a 5.3 rating on imdb um so there may be a reason why that's the uh oft maligned and oft forgotten spin-off from doctor who of many i mean just talking about it it sort of makes you realize how many there have almost been as really as well as how many there actually have been like it's mm. definitely i guess because it's such a popular show there's always temptation right to kind of think why don't we just do more? Let's do more of that. Let's just let's just do that, but more so. Um, mm. Because, you know, the TARDIS can only be in so many places and so many times, ironically enough. You kind of, you know, you can, you can and you can have stuff filming at the same time. Like, you know, during the Torchwood years, you could walk from the Torchwood hub across, you know, across the, across the studio and you'd be in the TARDIS. You know, like, mm. it was all part of the same thing, the same operation, filmed at film different times, keeping it all busy. If they were, if they were going to do a spin-off now, say from like the past two series, who would you, or what would you want the spin-off to be about? That's an excellent question. Um, I, the last, so in the, in the Jodie Whittaker era. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. Like, you, could have, you could have Warren Brown and Matthew McNulty, you know. Yeah, alien, one, alien hunters. One, yeah, one's an ex-cop, one's an astronaut, and together they hunt aliens. In space. <laughs> That would be quite good. I like that. Um, you could just watch the vlog of um, Gab Gabriella, whatever her name was, you know, uh, two girls <laughs> roaming. Just watch her vlog in, in real time. Prax Praxius is just ripe with characters who could yeah. uh, the Ruth support Doctor their own spin-off. Ruth Doctor Chronicles would be good. Oh, oh of, co of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, that's another one that um, fans have often campaigned for. They've, they've said they wanted, um, after Paul McGann came back for Night mm -hmm. at the Doctor, they said, can we not just have some, like, mini episodes on iPlayer? Give Paul McGann his Eighth Doctor spin-off, which kind of bridges the gap uh, between his first appearance and his last. Yeah. And, and now, similarly, people are saying, we want more Ruth Doctor. We want Joe Martin to have her own spin-off. Totally. Like, and I can completely see why they would, wouldn't do either of those in terms of, like, it would be distracting to have more than one Doctor and you don't want to undermine mm. it. But also, God, it'd be so cool. Like, I really <laughs> love Doctor. I just really would love to have seen more in that world. And it was such a... Considering, you know, how little time and clearly how little budget they had, it's a great little story. Mm. Like, I feel like they could definitely have done... And there's something quite lovable about really really low budget kind of doctor who you know what i mean like i think there's there's a, there's a market for it it's kind of reminds me of when mark gatiss does those ghost stories on bbc4 around christmas like there's something that i kind of love about just how like small and low budget they are and how much more inventive you have to be with it like i'd love that kind of you know freedom given to like a, a, a doctor who spin-off you know what what was paul mcgann up to you know all the other times I did, I did see a suggestion, this is not my idea, I can't take credit for it, that they should release um, sort of five minute, 12 five minute chapters of, uh, of, you know, featuring Paul McGann. And then that could come together to form a one hour episode mm -hmm. that you would then air on BBC One. So you sort of release the individual chapters online and then do a one off special on TV. Uh, you know, I'm just saying it's a great idea. You don't have to do it, but it's, yeah. you know, it's there. It's free. It's there if everyone wants to pick it up, you know. Get, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's filming it in his house at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, we should talk also. Um, we mentioned that we've been doing uh, Torture Watch Long. Uh, we've got some, we've got hopefully uh, one or two more of those in the pipeline. So keep your eyes and ears peeled and we'll let you know uh, if we've got more of those and QAs with the cast and so on. But also, we've got something else going on from the world of spin offs, haven't we, Morgan? Um, you've, got, you've got a burning bone to pick with the world uh, and you need to tell everyone about it. I do. So, you know, Doctor Who. Um, all 12 series are now available um, of the modern series are all available um, to stream on BBC iPlayer. Likewise, Torchwood, all four series. No such luck for the Sarah Jane Adventures. Uh, it was available on iPlayer a couple of years ago, but at the moment, uh, the Sarah Jane Adventures is not available to watch on iPlayer, nor is it available to watch as part of any uh, subscription service. Um, so I'm kicking off a campaign starting today. Uh, <laughs> Radiotimes.com is kicking off a campaign. Hashtag 
bring back SJA. Uh, we want uh, Sarah Jane Adventures back on iPlayer for fans to enjoy during lockdown. Um, so if you head to radiotimes.com, you'll find a uh, little poll. You can vote and we will be tallying up uh, every single vote. Uh, and we're hoping that we can show the BBC that there is real support out there for getting Sarah Jane back on iPlayer. Yeah, we should have the votes uh, in the link in the description below us in this uh, in this video, if anyone wants to go along and vote. Um, and yeah, please, you know, do let them know. I mean, I can't imagine anyone listening to this wouldn't want to see the Sarah Jane Adventures again. Um, yeah. No, I would. Um, and yeah, no, it feels like it feels like now's the time, right? Like, you know, we're all, you know, we're all at home. We could use some cheering up. There's only so much Doctor Who. There's quite a lot of Doctor Who. But eventually we're going to run out of Doctor Who and Torchwood. So bring on Sarah Jane, I say. It'd be fantastic to have Sarah Jane back on iPlayer. So yeah, please do go and vote. And then also uh, share the poll on social media using the hashtag BringBackSJA. Great. Uh, and that seems like a good point for us to take our leave. Again, thank you so much for listening to us natter on about Doctor Who spin-offs. Uh, if, you know, if, we, if you feel like we haven't talked enough about your favourite, please do you know, uh, tell us your thoughts in the comments. Uh, we've, you know, we said we've got more watch-alongs hopefully planned for uh, Torchwood. And yeah, we've got loads of great content about Torchwood, Sarah Day Adventures, and of course, Doctor Who on radiotimes.com. But for now, uh, I've been Hugh Fullerton. I've been Morgan Jeffrey. And thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.